It's a very great pleasure. Would you give a warm round of applause, please, to Conrad Wolfram. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for the intro and indeed the drum roll. Uh, I'm going to try and spend about 20, 25 minutes talking about computation and why I think it's central to the future of data. And I guess uh, I'm going to give a slightly high wire act, so we might have some excitement on my machine uh, while I do this. I'm going to start with a very simple question. Has more data led to better decisions? I think the answer to that is it depends. It's not as straight a track as you would like. And uh, I guess one of the main problems, I think, is what I would call information overload. I'm old enough still to remember before the web and I would guess that was information underload, and things have changed rather dramatically since then. Uh, and we've got a bigger problem coming. We've got much more data coming. You know, all of us are tracking everything we do all the time, and that's typically going into the cloud, medical data, data about you know, every email we send, and these sorts of things. There's much more data out there and available and accessible coming, and so this problem's gonna get a whole much worse. And I guess I would summarize the problem we've got right now with data as how to take it from available data that in principle is there and you can get to accessible, and how also to go from sort of averaged to personalized. Not just knowing the average answer, but knowing something personalized to you. Those are some of the key challenges, I think, that amount to the problem we've got with the overload of data right now. You kind of get lost in the forest, and you can't see the, the detail that you really need. And I think a major solution to this problem is what I'm going to call computation for everyone. Being able to somehow empower everyone ubiquitously to compute. Now, at the moment, Again, they've got machinery, but they don't necessarily have expertise or the automation in the machinery to do that. And I'm going to talk through some of the ways I think we can give that to everyone, as opposed to just a very limited number of people. So one of the problems right now is I think we currently have data set up for sort of human readability. And in the future, I think what we need is our data to be set up for citizen computation. And that's a facet of the way we compute from the data. It's also a facet of the data itself. If the data isn't computable, it's really hard to get computers to work with it. Maybe in 30 years' time, it'll be much, much easier. But it's still quite hard today. And so we've got to work with our data and get that straight, as well as getting our computation in line. Now, when you have computable data, you can do kind of nice stuff. So this is an example. I'm just going to type in a series of bases into, you know, and I'm going to try and see whether that sequence appears in the human genome. I'm going to do a live computation, everything being well. My network's still connected, hopefully, everything working. And hopefully, in a moment, it will compare that. There we go with the human genome. And it pulled out, as you can see, all the places, all the chromosomes that had that particular set of matches. It's pretty amazing. I mean, only a few years ago, we thought we couldn't even take, get a human genome. Now we can, in a few seconds on a laptop, go and compute that directly. But that's because the data that we have here that we're pulling is computable. It's ready to compute from the computer. So in a sense, the future, in my view, is about empowering the knowledge consumer to generate knowledge. Right now, we're sort of putting out knowledge for the consumer to kind of digest or read. I think the future is the knowledge consumer is themselves generating knowledge with the help of computation. And I've sort of called this Web 3.0 before, as opposed to a sort of Web 2.0 where humans are generating, all the human users are generating information. In a sense, this is sort of a computer-assisted version of that. Now, one of the things that happens over time is expertise kind of gets personalized. So, you know, years ago, kind of you had somebody who was an expert in typing to type stuff for you. Now you don't. You know, then you had graphics software. We do still, of course, have experts in doing graphics, but you get a lot further yourself. The web really, I think, was two things. It was personal fact-finding. You know, you can go to a librarian to find stuff, but usually you don't nowadays. You find it yourself, at least to a reasonable level of complexity, and also distributing your own data personally. And we've gone through things like digital photography. And I think now is the turn of knowledge, personal knowledge generation. 
you know, derivative knowledge, knowledge that's not just the base knowledge, but something computed from it. Now, uh, one of the things that you want to do is be able to access this knowledge with a good interface. And so one of the things it's nice to do is sort of some linguistic queries. So we could ask questions like, um, oh, I don't know, uh, how many people in Newport, uh, Wales, for example, and uh, we should hopefully get some sort of uh, result from that. Here we go. So that's the population of that, and it's automatically competitive. Now, it actually live computed this. It didn't just look it up. It computed this document out of that. We could ask something like, um, am I drunk, for example? And uh, it's going to compute what, what it thinks that means, and it's actually going to allow me to change various things. I think it's rather underestimated my body weight, probably. Uh, and um, it can recompute that. So in a sense, this is a personalized sort of uh, data. And that's one sort of interface. It's kind of what I would call linguistic. You just type it in. It's computing an answer. This is different from traditional search engines because we're actually trying to understand it and compute an answer, not just search for other people's answers. And, and you can do various uh, um, amusing things to, to test that. Now, actually, perhaps more amusing and, in a sense, modern is, uh, is in a sense, uh, voice linguistics, where you talk to your phone or something, and you try and get it to understand what you're talking about. So we could ask it something like, sheep in the UK versus people, number of people in Newport. I think it'll probably have messed that up, actually. Let's see. Uh, let's try that again. Well, I don't give it a misinformation. Number of people in Newport versus sheep in the UK. Uh, well, wait, I, okay, well, my computer, let's try one more thing here. Number of people in the UK versus number of sheep in Newport. I think it won't know that. Okay, well, I'm afraid Apple Siri is, normally Apple Siri directs things in a nice way. I'll have to try that again later. It seems to be having a gremlin at the moment. What I wanted to show you is that you can have a nice linguistic query and ask a question, usually, when it works, and you can just talk to your phone and get some sort of linguistics out. Let me just try this once again. Number of people in the UK versus France. Let's, uh... Okay. It's... Okay, so it did at least in this simple case, it's managed to produce the answer today. Um, other days it usually produces much nicer detailed answers than that. So that's one sort of interface. Linguistics, voice linguistics, getting your, uh, and as you see, these things are still under development to some extent. Another kind of interface thing you want is something which sort of does narrative. So you want to be able to, in a sense, have a knowledge app where you have set something up and then you want to ask a question of that app and you want it to be able to compute. So this was an example of trying to compute, uh, if you invested under the Tories or under Labor, what happened if you froze your investment under the opposite party and how long you think it takes for policy decisions to take effect. So if you think it takes zero years for policy to take effect, you can then compute how your stocks would have done over 50 or more years under these different governments and see what you think. But if you think it takes longer for policy effects to take, uh, to take account, then you can change it. So you, in a sense, as the reader, are driving some of the computation. You're not just being told you've got to assume something. You're actually testing something. Another type of interface that one needs to think about is sort of interactive reports. So this was a report that was done uh, in essentially for health. And what this is doing is actually giving you a complete readout anonymized health data where you can test yourself against one of the Middle Eastern countries' complete uh, surveys of the population. So if you're from that country, you could actually see if you fa factor in your health data and if you're a smoker. This is doing a live computation of your actual risks against that data. And this is another common sort of form of interface where you're interacting with a, essentially a live document. So one of the things I think this brings up is how do we make decisions? And it's kind of like, does one do it by instinct or by analysis or by some combination of both? I think in the past, you know, long ago, before numbers were really around, one could probably assume one mostly did it by instinct. One guessed. And there weren't too many numbers to guess off. Now I think one often takes analysis. But the trouble is, it can be very simplistic. You can get targets set. You know, 
is, are the three metrics for this hospital matched? Does that therefore mean the hospital's running well? Well, it doesn't necessarily, because the targets may be too simplistic. So I think we now should be going into an era where you can have what I call agile targets, where you take, in a sense, the decision, and you are trying to give people a kind of body of computable data from what you're doing so that they, the end user, whether it's a manager or you or the government, can go and quiz that data. You don't know what's going to be asked of your hospital if you're running a hospital. It's there, out there, and I think it makes it less gameable, and it's much more likely to combine the kind of instinct you as the person wanting to know what's going on has and uh, the actual numbers that fit in with that. So that's kind of, I think, the future of how you make those sorts of decisions. Now, what I wanted to do here, which may, I hope this won't be another gremlin here, but anyway, I was trying to compute a, uh, me obviously looking rather concerned uh, before this started to see that this would work, but uh, what I'm trying to do here is uh, image identify. Let's try this and see if, okay, there's the code. I'm going to rerun this now because it didn't seem to, it might just take a few seconds. This is an interesting mesh together of data and, uh, in a sense, um, uh, machine learning and all sorts of other things. So there it says I'm a person. It's trying to detect what I am. If I hold something like a glass up here, and give it a few seconds, it will probably figure out that something else, a percussion, a beer glass, a beverage, an aquarium. OK, well, it's basically, as you can tell, learning. And now I'm going to try. Uh, let's try and it's unfortunate I'm in the background, which is not really helping its detection. But let's, uh, let's try. This is a, a very recent thing that's, um, uh, that's gone up. So let, I'm going to try and sort of uh, tweet that. And uh, this may or may not, this may be horribly wrong. Um, but the idea was I wanted to show that you could do, you can really start to mesh together, you know, image recognition with machine learning, with pulling data, with semantic recognition, with tweeting something. And as I say, this is a pretty high wire thing and may not have actually tweeted, we'll have to see. Uh, but I wrote a little program there to tweet directly from the language. And it's, uh, it's kind of nice that one can string it. This is very modern technology. We released this just a few weeks ago. And it's, uh, it's, it's quite nice to be able to fit these things together. Now, one of the points I suppose I've been making the last few minutes is a key question whenever you look at data, which I ask very early on, is what's the interface? Too much data is put out where people say, oh, here's great data. The government have been guilty of this. Here's open data. And it's great to see that. It's much better than closed data. But again, if you throw the open data out, the question is somebody's got to interact with it. And the key question is, what's the interface for them to interact with it, and how, what's the, the human interface, and what's the machine interface? And people often think this is rather a simple thing that you deal with at the end. Worry about the data first. Not true. That's the hardest problem. And as the data volume goes up, and as our requirements of what we can get out of the data go up, that becomes one of the hardest steps. And it requires both the analytics to be right and also the base data to be right. Whatever you think the interface is, the value of the kind of computational knowledge is much greater than the value of dead information. Now, think of GPS and the mapping for that versus traditional old-style maps. The actual computable data is vastly more valuable and will become ever more valuable than that. So that's a key requirement for anyone who has data. And it's quite important to think of who does have knowledge assets, who has huge bodies of knowledge and smaller bodies of knowledge, you know, corporate information, most companies have their corporate information in a form where they get reports out, but they can't quiz it in a linguistic way. Um, we're helping to change that, but it's a slow process. You know, people like the BBC have lots of data, and of course we have our own data. We're putting it out through Facebook and all these other uh, social media platforms. That's in a sense our data, and those are knowledge assets. Now, governments, of course, have a huge body of data. And governments also have a centralized structure to be able to immediately, potentially do something with that if, if they get their act together. And it's quite salutary to think through what are the areas of government that you could really kick into action by getting the data and the analytics around that data in shape. Now, I don't think the fastest, but by far the most significant in the end is health. There is huge scope in health for efficiency by using computable data, both on a system-wide level, you know, by analyzing processes in hospitals, which are currently basically too messy and haven't been analyzed fully, uh, 
and by personal data. And I'd love to go to the doctor and hand them a wadge of my data. Here's how I am usually when I'm wet. In fact, I did this recently. I had a bug earlier this year. I was measuring my temperature. I was realizing I didn't really know what my temperature usually is. Right? I know what the norm of people's temperature is. But I don't actually know what my own is because I never bothered to measure it. Well, that's a big, you know, it's kind of significant because I, it's harder for me to tell whether I've got an abnormal temperature. That's the sort of personalization. And, and that and way, way beyond that will be critical in better diagnostics. If we can improve diagnostics in health, we can improve everyone's, you know, life essentially. We can make people's better interact with our health service. We can save money. We can get them much further. It's a critical, critical thing. And of course, all these other areas like social security, Economic assessment is a very obvious and quantitative one, um, et cetera. One of the things we've been trying to do is help in the process of getting data in shape. And uh, we recently launched a thing called Data Drop, which allows that to happen in some sort of semantic and computable way. Um, the other thing we're trying to do is set up a framework so that people can set the data computably called, uh, of their own setup without going through a data drop. And that's called the Wolfram Data Framework. And uh, it's still ongoing. It's quite hard to get these things set up in a way that's sort of beyond semantic. So in a sense, that's a little bit about what I think about how we make decisions better in the sense of the computer and the automation. I want to talk a little bit about the necessary human element of this. How do we get better at analyzing data? Now, it seems a bit paradoxical, right? I've just been saying the computer needs to get more automated, better, so that we can interact with it. Why am I now turning around and saying, actually, we need to change ourselves as humans to interact with the computer? Well, there's a very good reason, which is that when the computer can do more, when, in a sense, the mechanics, the machinery has got better, the human needs to go to a higher level. And the, uh, the higher level, the, the sort of place where you really see this in mainstream education is maths. Maths and, to some extent, the new uh, setup of coding. And so a few years ago, we launched computer-based maths to try and fundamentally reform maths education around the world with a very simple assumption. Assume a computer exists and use it for calculating things and rebuild the curriculum based on that assumption. There is no curriculum in the world right now that's really gone down that track fully, uh, although we have a first project in Estonia that I can mention. Let me explain what I mean by this, because I think it's very important to understand what the human element should be in the future of data science. So when you do maths, the question is, what are you doing? And I usually answer this. There are really four steps. You know, the first step is you're defining a question. If I go on talking for too long in this room and the room is airtight, how long can we all survive? That's a question. You're trying to abstract that then, translate it to math, and turn it into something you can compute. Why? Because for hundreds of years, people have worked out ways in which you can take a question, turn it into an answer using the power of maths. Then your computing answer, that's step three, which in the real world is happening almost always on a computer. In education, is almost always happening by hand. And then there's step four, which is you go back the other way. So I got an answer on my, you know, abstractly, x equals three. I'm going to go back and figure out, did that actually answer my question? So what's happening in education is we're spending almost all of our time doing step three by hand. And that is pretty disastrous. It's forcing people to spend all their time doing that. Most of them get bored. They don't like what they're doing. They don't understand how it fits in. They don't have any real questions to do. And it's not matching what they need to be able to do afterwards. It is totally disastrous. And the first countries that fix this will have a major step up in data science and other areas which require mathematics and coding. So my message here is when you have a change in the real world, as we have dramatically in the last few decades in terms of computers doing calculating, you need to stand on the power of that automation. You know, there's a choice for education. Do you force everyone to do what, what before the machine existed, right? Do you force people to do what, what was done before the machine existed and just go on doing that even though there's a machine which now does it fantastically better than them? Or do you decide, okay, we got the machines working, let's go further. And that's what's happening in the real world. So don't compete with the machines. In the end, you always lose if they're good and if they've worked, which computers clearly have. Now, one question is, how does maths and coding fit together? I think maths is a sort of system of problem solving and analysis for life. And coding, in a sense, is the way to express it. Coding is actually more important than I think the government have given it credit for. Coding is, in a sense, the way you write down your ideas, your technical ideas. 
And so if you can code, it's a bit like being able to, to write English, except that you're writing tech. And so coding is as central as that, and I think should be part of, of maths and given that sort of precedence. Now, I thought just to finish, I would try and, uh, try and live dangerously again by trying to write a little piece of code. And so what I thought is by this stage, um, you'd be fairly bored of seeing me. So I thought what I would do is I would try and write something that um, actually blocks my face out by doing uh, some analysis of this. So let's, uh, let's do this. And what I'm going to do is try and put a rectangle uh, over um, something that finds my, my face. And I guess I'm trying to find me in this. And hopefully, if I've done this right, uh, no, I've actually done something wrong, I think, because what I want to do is I want to show that, but I also want to show me at the same time. Otherwise, we won't I'll just see a rectangle, except I've now put too many things in. It's obviously too late today. And there we go. So I managed to block myself out uh, reasonably by combining some maths and some coding all together, it's identified my face, put a rectangle around it. I've written a piece of code there in a line which does that. I'm expressing what I think about this maths and this coding, essentially. So how did we come to be in this? Wolfram has been going now 27, 28 years. And we built many technologies to try and do computations. It was very specialized. It was just maths at the beginning. And now the world has very much wanted to democratize computation, particularly for data science. And so we've particularly been working on the cloud and making sure that we can implement everything through the cloud. It's kind of neat. You can now send an interactive application like I showed just through the cloud, and that works. So central to this is having a language, and that's the Wolfram language I was just uh, using there. So to summarize, um, our job has been to try and make computation meet knowledge. That's sort of our, our, our company motto. And our strategy is to build an ultimate computation ecosystem so that we can thread all of these pieces together. And I think that there's the human element, as I said, and there's the sort of automation element, which we and others are trying to push together. Those are the ways that we will get better decisions out of data. And uh, I suppose what I often say is we need to prepare for what I call the computational knowledge economy. So what does this mean? Well, knowledge economies, I think, are things where the majority of the sort of economic activity comes from sort of thinking using your brain more than using your hands. But I think we're up to the next level of that. That's not good enough right now. The next level is how do you combine the automation of computation and computers with your own knowledge? Those are the economies that are going to be at the highest sort of value chain end of, of activity in the future. Not just knowing the base knowledge, but knowing how to work with the automation to make your new knowledge. And that's what I call the computational knowledge economy, and which I think we need to prepare for uh, as fast as we can. So hope you like the talk. Unfortunately, one of the things we always have to do is sort of uh, try and make everything computable. And uh, this guy, gosh, I really have got gremlins going today. Um, this guy has decided, normally he's very happy, and I move him around. But for some reason, he's decided, let me, let me re reinvigorate him. He's, he's, oh well. For some reason, he's decided to not play ball with me today, so I'll have to leave it like that. Thank you very much.